take Yah's presence for granted or do we take advantage of the opportunities that have been afforded to us? Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10 Minute Tour, Day 5 of Mishpah Team. And so we're trying to conclude with chapter 24 today. As we come into this chapter, we read that there is a special invitation extended to 74 men. Moshe, Aaron, his brother, who will become the high priest. Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avahu, plus 70 of the elders of Israel. By special invitation, they are invited to come up onto the mountain and to there have fellowship with the creator of all the universe. The text says that when they arrived, that they saw the heavens, they saw Yahweh Elohim, They beheld a paved work of a sapphire stone that was clear, clear and bright like the heavens, working from beneath his feet. And they did sit down, they ate, they drank, and the hand of Yah was not extended against them as if they had violated his presence. What a powerful time of revelation that there is offered to these men. It is understood that they could approach to a certain level, close enough to see, but not close enough to touch, not close enough to completely perceive. There is a, shall we say, a respectable distance between man and his creator. And it's always been that way. Even when Yahweh was walking within the confines of the Garden of Eden, fellowshipping with Adam and Hava, there was yet a sense of distance between the two. Yah yearned for fellowship with them, and they in turn yearned for his presence. Yet there was an understanding of an unapproachableness to him, especially once sin entered the picture. Sin is still in the picture. And because of that fact, there is still a respectable needed distance between ourselves and Yahweh. Modern theology from modern pulpits have us to understand that you and I can freely come because of the name of the Messiah, as we would prefer to call him, and that we can come to the very throne room of the Most High, crawl up in Daddy's lap, love on him, throw our arms around his neck. He will hug us as a dear little child and that all will be well. We can tell him our desires, our great need, our favorite wants, and he loves us enough to dote on us and to give us to anything that we would wish for, anything that we would request. This is all afforded to us because of the great work of our Messiah and the super overabundance of grace that is always ready to be poured out no matter how we walk, no matter how we live, no matter how we choose to conduct our living before him. He knows that we are frail, that we are prone to mistakes, that we're only human after all. He overlooks our sins and gives us grace and mercy instead of correction, reproof, or at times the necessary judgment such as the fallacies of modern-day theologies. The reality is, in this same chapter, the prequel to man being afforded such close proximity is a period of time where Moshe reads the Book of the Covenant, and animals' lives are taken, and blood is spilled and collected, and that animal flesh is offered up as a sweet-smelling aroma unto the, unto the Creator, unto Yahweh. Blood is applied to the book and to the people. And their response is that all that Yah has said, we will both hear and we will do. Actually, it's the reverse of that. We will do and we will hear. Not say, Vanishma. There is a willingness expressed of the people, we will do whatever he asks of us. 
even before we hear and understand exactly what that requirement might be. We yield our entire beings to him, and we're willing to follow after him regardless of what is required of us. Modern day theology says, let's study the matter. Let's break the matter down in components and parts that we can understand. Let's pray for the understanding. And once we've attained the understanding, then let's figure out how the understanding would affect us what proper steps that we should take, one, two, three, and beyond. And after we prayed about it some more, we will actually begin to come up with a system and a program by which we will begin to implement what we think that the Creator has actually said to us all through the filter of, we know He asks nothing of us that is too hard. So we soften the blows, we milk it down, we dilute it, to it's easily processed. And then we congratulate ourselves on being this covenant people. I wonder how Yah views all of this process. The act of worship that was offered is that they were to bow themselves from a distance. This is the same activity that happens when Abraham entertains three strangers who show up at his tent's door. He bows himself to the earth. It's also the same activity that he says that he and Yitzhak or Isaac are going to perform once they go up onto the mountain and they bow and prostrate themselves, yield themselves, humble themselves before the face of the Most High, recognizing we're only the dirt that our face is lying on, except he gives us breath and life and animation and hope an opportunity, such as the ancient theology that somehow we seem to be missing in our day. Notice with me that Nadav and Avahu are among the men that go up onto this mountain and they see the heavens in his clearness and they behold Elohim. Perhaps they believe then that they were of a special class of people. For It's not too long in the future, Leviticus chapter number 10, that fire comes out from the very throne of Elohim, the very presence of the Most High within the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and consume the same two men. Now, whether you believe that they were drunken on that day or just overstepped their bounds or got caught up in zealous worship, however it happened, they stepped over a line that was not offered to them and they died. Aaron died early. Moshe did not enter into the promised land. Again, perhaps because they thought something was afforded to them, but was not. There are a couple things I want us to conclude with today. First, there are those that Yah seems to afford greater proximity to himself than others. This isn't fair, but then again, Yah is not about being fair. He's about a, he is about being righteous and being just. So fairness and equity do not seem to enter into his equations. Yah looks out and sees those whose hearts are purest before him and those he seems to invite to a closer place before him than the rest of us. We can act out of jealousy And we can think, well, that's just not fair. But then again, he is the creator and we're not. And we should not be jealous or envious, but we should be thankful that there are those who are close enough to him to hear what he has to say and bring back a clear, a very vibrant and accurate word from his presence. Secondly, if Moshe was granted such close access to Yahweh, then how is it then that there are those who say that the words that he brought back no longer remain applicable to us? They have nothing to do with our lives. We're talking about a man who stood in the very presence of Yahweh Elohim of Israel, the creator of all the universe, and was only separated from his face by a very thin, smoky veil. And he heard Yah's words audibly. I believe we need to listen to what the man heard. 
and make application. May Yah bring us into his presence on this Shabbat. And may we find him filled with his glory and the power of his presence. Shabbat Shalom. We'll talk to you again next week. 